TCL is a proud sponsor of the 1500 ESPN Studios. TCL, America's fastest-growing TV brand. Minnesota Vikings, the NFL, football, yeah, football. Welcome to Purple Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Purple Podcast. Matthew Collar here and joining me from Pro Football Focus is Eric Eager. Eric, how are you? I'm doing well, man. How about you? I am great. Uh, we have finally entered, and I was waiting for when it would happen, the Kirk Cousins debate zone. Kirk Cousins debate zone. Uh, you know, the, I mean, so one thing that we've really avoided with Kirk Cousins until now is the national talking head guys yelling at each other about Kirk Cousins and the fan base debating Kirk Cousins and are you team Cousins or team not Cousins? We haven't really had any of that, but now since he threw a pick six on national TV against New Orleans, his fault or not, that's what put him in the spotlight. So through eight games, Eric, what can you tell us about what the numbers say about Kirk Cousins' performance through the first half of the first season of the Cousins era in Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, when you put it like that, right, it, it, it sounds like you know we're only one sixth of the way through the Cousins era, and yet it feels like you know we we've, we've been debating him for years. Um, I would say you know what Cousins has done is he's he's put the Vikings in the conversation for you know, being in contention in an NFC that's a lot weaker than we thought it was, right? Green Bay is 500. The Bears, nobody really believes in them with Trubisky. And then, of course, Detroit today traded away one of their best players. So I think that they're, I think that Cousins has been good enough for the Vikings to be obviously in contention for the NFC North. And yet, as you guys said on the, the Purple Podcast, I think right after the game, there are just these plays that he has you know, some of them his fault, some of them not, but there are just these plays that he has that keep him, I think, from being in that upper echelon conversation with the Drew Breeses and the Tom Brady's and the, and the Aaron Rodgers of the world. And whether that's, you know, obviously I think the interception is not really his fault. And, and frankly, on a per play basis, he's really limited his negatively graded plays. Um, but there are just these like, there's just these plays every single game that sort of, in my opinion, keep him, um, from being, kind of in that upper echelon conversation and we see it as you you know as we talk about on air they're kind of middle of the pack in terms of yards per play he's middle of the pack actually kind of maybe even lower third in epa generated so expected point data generated for drop back um and it's just those like big turnovers it just doesn't seem like he has kind of that intuition for so i was playing around with some numbers about the turnovers or big plays against kirk cousins throughout his career as a starter, so in 56 games, he has 78 either interceptions or fumbles and the fourth most yards lost to sacks in the NFL during that time span. And the two of the three guys ahead of him are Russell Wilson and Cam Newton, who are running quarterbacks. So obviously they're going to be in there with the yards lost to sack because they move around a lot and, and end up with big losses from time to time. But it just really stuck out to me that Cousins has lost 850 yards to sacks in 56 games. And if you compare that to some other quarterbacks who have played similar amounts, I mean, Tom Brady has only lost 580 yards during that time. Ben Roethlisberger, 484 yards during that time. And it sticks out to me that it's not just that there's an interception like the other night, which Stephon Diggs said was his fault because he didn't continue to run and he thought something was going to happen that didn't. Game's going really fast. Bad plays happen. Okay. But it's a trend over now four years of starting where these big negative plays end up happening with Cousins. Yeah, and if you look at, like, you know, he's been under pressure almost half his drop backs. And obviously, you know, some of the pressures that a quarterback is under are his fault, but many aren't. And we know it's been well documented the Vikings offensive line is not very good. However, you know, you know the Cousins apologist will tell you he's got a 91 pass rating when under pressure, which is true. But as you said, the sacks, a sack is generally from an expected points added perspective worth two points, right? And so that's why we see a guy like Cousins grade pretty well from PFF, for example, have a high pass rating, put up a lot of yards, 
And yet when it comes down to it, you always ask the question, well, why are the Redskins eight and eight? Why are the Vikings four, three and one? Despite, despite honestly having two receivers that I think in Vikings history, the only comparison is Moss and Carter. You know, why are the Vikings only four and three? Why are they lower part of the league in terms of points per drive? All that kind of stuff. And it's because there are these things that are kind of hidden from fantasy football, possibly hidden from the box score stats that are underlying that I don't know how much of the blame we give to Cousins, but last season, you know, for example, Case Keenum, in terms of on pressure dropback, was sacked the second least among all quarterbacks to Phillip Rivers, right? So there are just these like little things that I think Cousins does that, you know, are somewhat irritating. And if you watch it long enough, kind of, even though that interception, for example, to PJ Williams probably wasn't his fault, it was totally expected, I think, by people like you and me. Yeah, the thing that we talked about a little after the game was that even if it's not his fault, it's not anywhere near an anomaly for him. Like with Adam Thielen, the fumble is out of my mind already because it's just a random thing that never happens to the guy. Yeah. I mean, the only other time I can remember Thielen making any type of mistake was the fumble in Thursday night football against the Dallas Cowboys where he inexplicably yeah. tried to return the punt but probably shouldn't have been returning a punt anyway. And so in three years, you could think of two mistakes the guy has made where with Cousins, it's been kind of a weekly basis type of thing. So I guess my question is, Eric, given the unpredictable nature of fumbles, fumbles lost and versus recovered and, and bounces and interceptions where you see some years a guy will have a high interception total and some years not. How can we predict the second half of this season and what is going to happen with Kirk Cousins here going forward? And to that end, really, what whether the Minnesota Vikings are actually a Super Bowl contender or not? Yeah, I mean, turnover-worthy plays that, like, we chart are far more stable than interceptions, right? Which, as you said, are sort of a product of luck and, and that kind of thing. And when it comes to, like, comparing him to some of the league's best quarterbacks, he's far higher than the guys like Breeze and Rivers and and Rodgers and guys like that. So I do think that this kind of trend will continue for Cousins. It's, you know, if you're a Vikings fan, though, you look at it and you say, okay, well, you know, they've been able to survive the games against some of the weaker teams despite some of these foibles because, you know, he has on his on his good plays, he's been terrific, right? As I said, he has a 90-something passer rating. When pressured, he's over 100. When clean, when he delivers the ball to Diggs and Thielen, it's a, the offense hums, right? So, like, we're not saying, you know, this is a bad offense or anything. What we're saying is, like, when you get into a game with a team that is capable of beating you and beating you soundly, you cannot make those mistakes. And I think if you're a Vikes fan, you look at the playoffs, and you're going to be against a team like the Rams, you're going to be against a team like New Orleans, probably on the road. In the first round of the playoffs, you might face Green Bay. You might even face a Washington team that's, I think, more sound than you are in terms of defense and not turning the ball over. Those mistakes are, you know, we saw it. The Vikings went from possibly being up 10 points going into halftime, coming out of halftime with the ball, to losing a game by three scores eventually, right? And uh, that backdoor touchdown notwithstanding, right? So th those are the things, and I think that's kind of the reason that uh, you look at Cus historically why he's been you know, he's been good, but his teams have not been terrible, but they have also not, like, gone 12-4. and four. You need that kind of consistency that you get from the Breezes and those kind of guys to see those teams have that kind of success. Now, I was thinking about this uh, with just, like, Andy Dalton is an example of a guy that comes to mind for me when I think of someone who's similar to Kirk Cousins, who profiles similarly where when his supporting cast has been great, then he's been great. And when it hasn't, he hasn't. And there have been inconsistencies in his game and he hasn't won a whole lot. Right. So I think that there are similarities there, even though I would probably take cousins over Andy Dalton. But mm -hmm. w what comes to mind is just that some of the hot stretches for Dalton have been so good that you believe he could actually win the Super Bowl if he got hot for those games. Joe Flacco like or Eli Manning like with cousins. Is that the case? I mean, is that the way you look at it as if he's hot enough through a section or is he just who he is more often? It, you know what I mean? Like what's the variance on cousins? Is he hot or cold or is he mostly who he is? Yeah. I mean, the Dalton thing is a great comparison, I think, because you get the high, as you said, the high variance. So when you think of like 
I, I think of the opposite of that to be a guy like Sam Bradford, right? Where you knew that, like, if you played Sam Bradford out for a whole season, you were going to basically get what you got in 2016, which are, you know, a deck of cards with six, sevens, eights, and nines, right? Whereas, like, Dalton has, you know, a couple twos and a couple threes, but a lot of face cards too, right? And that's why when you look at the 2015 Bengals, you put together a really good offensive line, A.J. Green, Muhammad Sanu, Marvin Jones, Tyler Eifert, you can go 12 and 4, right? And, you know, and then also the Bengals have had some losing seasons recently because, again, a lot of those twos and threes show up. I think Cousins is similar. He's closer, though, in my opinion, um, as a passer to Bradford in the sense that you get somewhat, you get some confining, uh, you know, his ups are not all that up and his downs aren't nearly as down as Dalton, in my opinion, but, uh, it, it is similar. It's weird though that so far in, in Cousins' career, we have yet to see. There was a graphic during uh, the Washington game where they said like, after the last 15 games, Washington's been 500. After the last 24 games, they've been 500. Like that team is pro- profoundly a 500 team, and I think that speaks to the fact that Cousins has a very difficult time stringing extremely brilliant play or extremely poor play together. What I think it, it generally is is just the poor plays tend to tend to kill games the way that we saw. Uh, against New Orleans. And one of the causes of that, even though he does have a decent quarterback rating when pressured, is the offensive line situation. And just looking at the PFF grades, 2017 was his lowest since becoming a full-time starter in 2015 and goes along with probably no coincidence that he was pressured and sacked the most that year and they had a lot yep. of offensive line injuries and here we are with the Vikings and I'm watching the other night. Now he's making some great throws under pressure. He's getting the ball off just before someone smacks him and dropping it right in. But A, that's not generally sustainable, right? Through long periods of time with uh, performing under pressure. And this Vikings offensive line, when it plays against good teams, is going to give up almost every other play someone in Kirk Cousins' lap. I think that if we're talking about him going on a run in the playoffs that not improving the offensive line in the offseason is going to be the thing that ends up biting them as much as a bad play could, because I could see him going a stretch without a horrible play that is a pick six or something, but what I can't see is a stretch where the offensive line can keep someone like Aaron Donald in check, someone like Cameron Jordan in check, and every one of these playoff teams is going to have that. Yeah, and the thing about pressure is that it comes in many different ways, right? So... For example, if you look at the Buffalo Bills game, the Buffalo Bills were able to get pressure generally with just their front four, right? So when, you know, whereas some teams have to blitz to create pressure and if a quarterback can get the ball off among, you know, amidst that, there are going to be receivers of Diggs and Thielen's caliber wide open and they're going to be able to do what they do with the ball after the catch, right? So that's why what we've seen historically is that passer rating with clean is far more of a stable variable than passer rating when pressured. And that's again, because, you know, you're going to face a team that, you know, I believe I have to watch it back, but I believe the Jets needed to bring players a lot more than Buffalo or Arizona did. Mm-hmm. And hence, you know, Cousins struggled against the latter and was finding it the former because, you know, you have receivers like that. And I think a lot of it is, you know, when you're in Washington, your receiver, not only was your offensive line hurt, but your receivers are hurt, right? So when you're under pressure, you can't quite trust you know, you can't throw the ball to Thielen while he's slow dancing with P.J. Williams. He's going to be able to catch it over his head, right? So that's kind of like the – that's, I think, the difference. And so if you're a Vikings fan, you can sort of bank on the fact that you have these two great receivers. On the other hand, if you catch a play like they did on that fourth down where, you know, the other team can can sort of cover up Thielen and, and Diggs, you have to throw the ball to Treadwell or Rudolph, and that has not been a successful uh, proposition. And hence, so – you know, I think that just them not fundamentally having a good offensive line is probably going to bite them at some point, even though it really hasn't to a drastic degree so far. So what is your read on where the Vikings stand in the NFC? You mentioned that maybe the NFC isn't as strong as we thought, and the Detroit Lions yep. made a choice to sell Golden Tate, which really surprised me. I, I thought that they would just could continue to try to hang in here, considering they're not that far back, and nobody is really truly great in the NFC North, uh, but instead the Lions pretty much cashing in their chips here, which I think gives the Vikings a huge advantage for Sunday. So maybe there's two wins potentially against the Lions team that's given up, but the schedule ahead is still pretty tough for the Vikings here. 
Lucky's 13 Pubs has you covered for the best game day experience this football season. Tons of TVs, legendary appetizers, amazing fresh half-pound burgers, handcrafted sandwiches, and a wide variety of other pub favorites. The drink menu is awesome, too. Huge selection of tap beer, handcrafted cocktails, and the best Bloody Marys in town. Seriously, these Bloodies are awesome. Try the Bacon Bloody, the Jalapeno Bloody, the Mother Mary, or just get a flight and try them all. Plus, Lucky's 13 celebrates Sunday Fun Day. Happy hour all day long on Sunday, every Sunday. Events and prize giveaways during games, too. Lucky's 13 has locations in Bloomington, Burnsville, Mendota, Plymouth, and Roseville. Having people over for the game? Call ahead to Lucky's and order some of those legendary apps, and they'll be ready to bring home when you get there. It's football time at Lucky's 13 Pubs. Find them online at Lucky's13Pub.com. Lucky's13Pub.com. It's the most wonderful time of the year, football time. And Lucky's 13 Pubs has you covered for the best game day experience. Lucky's13Pub.com. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we have them, you know, moving forward with basically like kind of a top 12 difficulty in terms of schedule. So, you know, they started the season. It was actually, a, they've gotten through a, a decent stretch here playing the Rams and the, and New Orleans. But again, you still have New England. You still have Seattle, who's a far better outfit than people thought at the beginning of the year. You have, uh, Green Bay. Uh, and I think that even without, you know, I think Ken Galladay is one of the next great receivers in the NFL. And you also have Marvin Jones. They, they run the ball really well with carry on Johnson. So I don't think Detroit is as easy of a time as people are going to, you know, think now that Golden Tate's out. Uh, I think, you know, Matthew Stafford, you could argue is, is a better quarterback than Kirk Cousins. So you still like don't necessarily have an advantage there either. So, um, you know, the Bears defense is very good. They're going to put pressure on, on Cousins, I think, especially at Soldier Field. So they have a tough schedule going forward. I think what helps them though is that the NFC is just this kind of, you know, beyond New Orleans and the Rams. So they're probably not going to get one of the top two seeds, but beyond New Orleans and, and Los Angeles, you know, you're basically fighting against Washington and Philadelphia for, you know, the three seed if you can win the NFC North. And, and I, you know, the Packers, I think have, you know, coming up a pretty difficult schedule of New England, uh, and, and again, Minnesota. So, and so forth. So. I think the Vikings still have an inside track to win the NFC North. We, we're going to do our simulation tonight. I would probably put it at about a 40 to 45% chance to win the division and probably about a 50, 50 to 55% chance to make the playoffs. So I still think despite their slow start, they're, they're going to be in the mix, uh, moving forward. So what do we think about the Bears at this point? I have a really tough time figuring out if I think they're good because I don't have a ton of respect for what I've seen from Trubisky outside of against the Tampa Bay Bucks, who everyone lights up. But aside from that, there seems to be some weaknesses there, but their defense is really fantastic, and Khalil Mack is a guy that can ruin your game plan. Uh, them and the Packers, it, it really feels like it's up in the air with these three teams still. Yeah, Trubisky's an interesting statistical case. So we talked about Cousins. Cousins is a far better PFF grade, <clears throat> but their offense, has actually generated fewer expected points per dropback than Trubisky hmm. because you get the big plays with Tariq Cohen, you get the Allen Robinsons, the Trey Burtons, and then you actually get what, what Trubisky is interestingly, he has just as many negatively graded throws as positively graded throws, whereas Cousins is more like two to one. However, you know, Trubisky's, his negatively graded throws are simply being inaccurate on throw, like traditional throws, right? So that there's that joke that Arif has that he can't throw left. It's actually somewhat true. And so I think on a play for play basis, Trubisky simply is not solid enough to keep up. Um, but what you have there is you, I think, have a pretty good supporting cast, a little bit underrated, uh, with the receivers and the, and the running backs, the tight end that they have. Offensive line is far better than what Minnesota has. And then the defense, if Cleo Mack plays, I think they built their defense pretty solidly. Uh, I don't like the Bears moving forward because they don't have any first round picks. And if Trubisky falters, they have almost no out. But for this season alone, I think I think the Bears, you know, if they can get a small uptick from Trubisky, could you know uh, challenge the Vikings. I think for now, though, I think the Vikings are, have a decided edge over them, just because Trubisky sim- simply hasn't hasn't performed. I think at the level that people want him to. So let me ask you before we uh, wrap up: Who is your favorite Detroit Lions journeyman quarterback ever? Because uh, Sage Rosenfels and I are going to do a podcast tomorrow. And I know that you are also a journeyman quarterback enthusiast. People have really loved yes. journeyman quarterback of the week. And this is like, 
aside from maybe Arizona and Cleveland, this is like the this team. This is a great one. Yeah. Yes. So, so I think what you got, which is great, is you have like the, the, every single like journeyman backup has made his way through Detroit, right? So from, you know, Dan Orvlovsky to Sean Hill to Jeff Garcia to Stony Case to Gus Ferrat, our Gus Ferrat, Minnesota, Dave Craig, right? They've all like made it through Detroit. And, and that makes it a special place in my opinion. Um, but to me, my favorite journey, and he actually wasn't really a journeyman because he actually, his last NFL team, I think he got cut by the Jaguars and then the Vikings is former first round pick Heisman Trophy winner Andre Ware. <laughs> yes. First round pick in 1990 out of the University of Houston. This was back before people realized that college production needed to be taken with a grain of salt because they also took David Klingler. Uh, the Bengals took David Klingler like two years later from the same Houston. But Andre Ware, who was unable to start over Rodney Pete, who's also a good one, and Eric Kramer, who's also a good one, for like four years. And he, he joined the Vikings in 94 to back up Brad Johnson and Warren Moon. And instead of going with Ware as the third quarterback, Danny Green decided to go back to Sean Salisbury. Uh, for that season instead. And then Ware joined the, the expansion Jacksonville Jaguars, didn't make it out of that training camp. And I think now he's an NFL, he is like an ESPN college football analyst. But to me, that's my favorite one. I think uh, for me now, Sage and I are going to go through the entire laundry list, but um, I will say this. I could not stand Scott Mitchell. I think Scott Mitchell, who had the, was quarterbacking their best offenses that they've ever had in like team history. Yep was yep. the most obnoxious quarterback. Uh, yeah. I, I hated his body language, and he just – talk about a guy who always had an interception in him or a really bad throw or whatever. <laughs> else. Like, that was Scott Mitchell for sure. And also, I really wanted Barry Sanders to get a title, and Scott Mitchell was just awful in their wild card games that he got them to and just, just ruined it for me. Just, just gave so, Barry, so Barry no chance. So here's a here's a great Mitchell one, which gets you all the way back to another journeyman that I forgot in my in my screed there. So the the 1995 Detroit Lions started three and seven or three and six or something like that, and for like the eighth straight year, Wayne Fonts was on the hot seat, and Scott Mitchell got hot and they won the rest of their games. They went like ten and six, <laughs> and Lomas Brown Lomas Brown said that they were going to beat the Eagles in Veterans Stadium. Rodney Pete quarterback in the Eagles, you know, uh, circle of life Simba. And, uh, and the, the Detroit Lions lost so badly. It was like 59 to like 30. They were losing so badly that the Lions pulled Mitchell for Don Mikowski. Wow. I think, I, mean, I, I think I remember that. Yeah. That was the game where like the, the legend was that the, that the Eagles put like cat litter on their, on their turf to stop <laughs> Barry Sanders, something like that. And, and apparently it worked. Uh, that's hilarious. I'm looking at these numbers and the lions had a top 10 scoring offense with Rodney Pete one year, Eric Kramer, the next year, two years yep. later, Dave Craig. And then the next year, number two in points in the NFL with Scott Mitchell was Barry Sanders. He's the like exception to the, anyone can play running back and, uh, yep. running backs don't impact things that much. He is the exception to that. I, yeah, I, I would say very much so. Um, and the crazy thing about Sanders was, you know, we talk about, oh, you know, these guys break the mold now because they can catch, they can block. Sanders couldn't catch and can block. Right. And still like that, that great of a player and that impacted his team that much. Poor Wayne Fonts, I, you know, like, if I, if you could ever get me to wear, uh, team gear now, I would totally wear Wayne Fonts' <laughs> like starter pullover. Is that the one with the, um, with the pouch in the middle? The pouch in the middle, the half zip. Yeah, that was yeah. great. I I had one of those for a certain team. So, all right. Well, Eric, all of your insight on Kirk Cousins, uh, extremely valuable, and we will be talking again throughout the seasons. Now that that button has been pressed, you can't unpress it. When it's the fan base is split, the media is split. Uh, not necessarily local media, but the you know, talking head people who yell at each other. 
Um, when once it's become a debatable topic, then it doesn't go away. Like I saw the other day on TV, there was some sort of LeBron and Jordan debate. Like it just once once that it goes, it's on forever. And with Kirk Cousins, because of the contract, it will be. Yeah, you can't put that genie back in the bottle. No, you cannot. All right, Eric. Well, thank you very much for your time, and thank you all for listening to the Purple Podcast. Going to Pittsburgh, I'm Ed Donahue with an AP News Minute. President Trump will be in Pittsburgh later today to meet with families and friends of the victims of the deadly synagogue shooting over the weekend. Rabbi Walter Jacob was at a funeral for one of the 11 victims of the shooting. It's very kind of him to come, but... um... How helpful it'll be in the midst of all of this uh, chaos of mourning, I don't know. In Wisconsin today, former Vice President Joe Biden says after the synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh, it's time to restore civility. This is not who we are. We need to recognize that words matter. Words matter. Biden says it's time to restore some dignity to our national debate. State police say a nine-year-old girl and her twin six-year-old brothers were killed this morning when a pickup truck struck them in northern Indiana as they were crossing a road to board a school bus. Another student was injured. I'm Ed Donahue.